The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Welcome to American Veteran. I'm Dale Parrish, your host, along with my co-host Bud Mendenhall. Our guest today is Ed Hagedorn. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard Ed speak. He's, he's been to a lot of schools, spoke to a lot of, of our students. Uh, Ed is a World War II veteran, a Korean War veteran. He earned the uh, combat infantry badge. He was uh, awarded the, the Silver Star and the Bronze Star. What else, Ed? <laughs> many, many more. Yeah, many, many, many more. Asiatic Pacific Campaign Ribbon, the Korean uh, Campaign Ribbon. Uh, the only one I didn't get was the Purple Heart. You're fortunate. Very fortunate. fortunate. <laughs> well, let's talk about your World War II experiences. You was in the South Pacific. I was in the South Pacific. I was in. Uh, first of all, uh, graduated from Fort Wayne Central High School, and of course we didn't have to look for jobs in World War II. The U.S. government had uh, jobs waiting for us in the military. I went to Camp Landing, Florida, which at the time was the largest infantry replacement training center in the United States. Spent 13 weeks there and uh, went through their grueling infantry program. And uh, then I decided uh, rather than walk, I'd like to fly, so I uh, volunteered and went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, to join the Airborne. And uh, on my last jump from the tower, the last tower jump, why my leg, knee gave out, and a major said to me, uh, how'd you get in the military with a knee like that? And I said, well, they take anybody that when time of war that they need. So that didn't stop them. I, I, was went home and proceeded to take a about a 50-day cruise to the South Pacific and uh, the place that they sent us to was New Guinea. Now why this place was ever God ever left it on this earth I'll never know. Nothing but jungles, swamps and snakes and you you name it and it was there so we uh we went through a crash course on jungle fighting there that uh took us about uh, uh two or three weeks and uh then uh we de we were sent the air force was on a little island north of new guinea which was uh, mortai island and uh, they were getting, there were still Japs on the island up in the mountains, and they'd come down at night and harass the air for airmen, and they didn't appreciate that. So they wanted some infantry people to come there. So uh, they sent us <laughs> up there to flesh out the Japanese and make life easier for the air, boy, air boys. So uh, we, we had about a two or three week operation there and uh, then they uh, sent us to uh, the Philippines and that's where I joined 
by 1st Infantry Division, the 33rd Infantry Division, which was the old Illinois National Guard. And uh, it was there that uh, I saw my first combat uh, on Luzon. And uh, as it happened to be, my first taste of combat was a kamikaze attack. And uh, I was in machine guns then, and uh, uh, they just, you, these guys coming, running, and hollering, and screaming, and waving bayonets, waving their sabers, and everything. And uh, you just cut them down. And uh, you mean, I mean to tell you that uh, I was scared about out of my skin because I had never seen anything like this, that people totally, life meant nothing to them. And uh, from there, that was my first, first taste of combat. And uh, we, we chased General Yamashita, who was a butcher of the Philippines. Our job was to try to catch him and uh, we tracked him all the way up the mountain trails in northern Luzon. And uh, on the way we saw where the Japanese had prison camps in, in the mountains. They'd be dug out of the mountains. And uh, if you took a Japanese prisoner and give him to the to the uh, Filipinos to take back to interrogate. They'd come back in about 10 minutes and uh, I said, what'd you do with him? He, we knew he, he, you didn't get back to headquarters. Uh, he tried to escape, so he went over the cliff. So one side of this trail that we were on was right straight down, the other side was right straight up. Well, the Japanese, Come to find out about it, uh, interrogating the uh, the Filipinos, the Filipino, the Japanese made them dig these caves in the, in these mountains, and then after they got them dug, they'd execute them. And uh, as we came along there, we found a Japanese uh, hospital where there was wounded Japanese soldiers in there, but before we got there, they executed all of them, all of their own people, so that we wouldn't capture them. And uh, on, the, on the way up, uh, we had several firefights, and, uh, but one of the caves that we come across was unbelievable. It was full of money. It was full of, Jap of, of Filipino pesos, uh, silver pesos that were about the size of the American silver dollar. The Japanese tried to set them on fire, but we got there first. And uh, so the fun part of it is that after we got back to, back to camp, they couldn't figure out why everybody was sending home so much money when we was only making about $35 or $40 a month. We were sending home a hundred, two hundred dollars a month, and uh, so they finally dawned on them what had happened. And after that, why well, you couldn't send home any more than what you made. <laughs> but uh, I ended up, I had uh, probably fifty of these burnt pesos at home. And one one time when we were robbed, they lost all of them. But uh, we. Uh, we went on up the trail. Now, we never did catch up with Yamashita. However, when we reached a point, all at once they said they were going to pull us back, the 33rd Infantry Division, and we went back to uh, Lenganyan Gulf, and boy, it was like heaven. We had a we had a outpost there, that tent set up, uh, volleyball courts, uh, basketball courts, and everything that we could we could really enjoy ourselves. It was no longer any military life about it. 
However, that only lasted a week when they told everybody to pack up and uh, we went, we boarded ships and the army had uh, taken over an island, completely eliminated everybody on it. They sent them back to the main island of Luzon. And we spent over a week, day, twice a day, over the side of the ship, down, down the, the rope ladders, down to the bouncing LCIs in the water. And uh, little did we know what was going on. We knew that apparently we were taking amphibious training. And uh, after about a, a week or two weeks of this, uh, which we got mighty sick of day after day. It was the same thing over and over. Uh, one morning, one of the guys come down below deck and he said, hey, there ain't no land around anymore. Well, we were steaming away from there. Little did we know where we were, where we were going. And uh, then the first thing we heard was the uh, atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and uh, here we had rendezvoused with the fleet. Every place we looked was ships as far as you could see and uh, uh, lo and behold what happened was a typhoon and we, we were in there and everybody sick and uh, my buddy and I, we decided that, hey, uh, boy, we ain't ate for a couple of days, so we decided to, to, go, to go down and, and get some food. Well, you, you went through the line, got your food, and then you stood up. Well, the ship was rolling around, and, and uh, the guy across from us, we were doing pretty good, but the guy across from us, uh, he decided that, he couldn't hold it down anymore. He threw up and all in our, hit our trays and everything. And our stomach started to roll and we made as fast as we could up on the deck and uh, uh, get some fresh air. And I mean the, the, what the Navy, what the Navy calls the heads stunk so bad you couldn't hardly go in them because of people being sick and throwing up and everything but well. anyway <laughs> we survived this ordeal and uh, then the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and uh, they called us in uh, after that they called us in the officers first and then the non-coms <clears throat> and explained what our mission was going to be well our mission was going to be the invasion of uh, Hanshu, or Kyushu, we were going in at uh, the town of Miri, Miriaka or some such name as that. Uh, some of these names kind of at my age. Is that one of the main Japanese? Yeah, it was, the, uh, it was not the main island, but it was the next main island, yeah. uh, south of the island of Tokyo, and that was on. And... Uh, they, uh, they said this is where our invasion was going to be and that our platoon, our company, was going to be the first ashore, was going to make the assault there. And our, the, the, uh, the platoon I was in was going to be the assault platoon on that shore, so we'd have never made it there alive. Nothing but pillboxes and everything there. And uh, so, thankfully, the uh, war was over with. However, uh, the Navy decided that, uh, well, we ought to make this look like an uh, invasion of Japan. So the LCIs dropped their door down about uh, 100 yards or so from the beach, and we waded in <laughs> up to our chest in the water. Uh, but uh, it was a very, very strange 
situation. We knew we were being watched. Uh, there was Japanese police there, uh, but nary a citizen was, you could see. But we kind of had a feeling they were looking out of their bamboo windows and so forth to see what was going on because they were told that the American forces <clears throat> would rape all the women and, and yeah. everything, which never occurred at all. The police led us to a train station, and uh, the, our infantry newsletter from the 33rd Division, uh, the last one we got, showed the pictures of uh, our division marching to the train. And the train took us up to uh, Kobe, Japan, which is on the main island, one of their main industrial centers. Kobe, Osaka. Well, we went there, and then our our the platoon I was with and the company, we were sent to a town called Hamiji. Uh, Hamiji had a huge army base there, and uh, our job was to go there and uh, dispose of all of the weapons and everything that had left behind, uh, which we did, and. Uh, then we settled into a regular army life, and uh, we set up uh, ball fields and uh, things like that. We had a, a gymnasium where we played basketball, and uh, fortunately in Japan, uh, I had been somewhat uh, accustomed to athletics in Fort Wayne here, and so my rest of my time in Japan became uh, very nice. I played uh, on our division football team, our division baseball team, and our division fast pitch softball team. So I traveled all over Japan, fortunate enough to see uh, most all of the cities. Well, <coughs> excuse me, one of the fantastic things was that uh, I had been in Japan about, uh, oh, I would guess uh, a month, and uh, one of our jobs took us to Hiroshima. And uh, so uh, we went there and looked, and utterly destruction. Never seen anything like it in my life. You couldn't even comprehend it. Uh, just looked for miles, nothing but flattened buildings and stuff. And uh, even the trees, the, some of them were starting to green up. One side of the tree would be burnt black and the other side would have green leaves starting to shoot out. And uh, so I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to see uh, the destruction that we'd done there. However, it was done for the good of the American Army forces because they predicted that the casualties for the invasion of Japan would amount to a, over a million soldiers. So the way I looked at it, they started the war in Hawaii, bombing it when it was unprotected and everything and uh, done tremendous damage there, so uh, turnabout is fair play, so. Uh, <coughs> How long were you uh, there uh, after the Ann bomb hit? How days did it take you to get in there where it was hit? Well, uh, we got there right after the, the war ended, mm -hmm. and I think the two atomic bombs that were dropped were dropped just what, a week or two weeks Amazing. before the war was ended. So uh, I was probably there within uh, two months. Two months, wow. And uh, then a uh, uh, stroke of, <laughs> of luck, uh, I met a very beautiful Japanese girl. And uh, she was uh, a high school graduate. She was going to study to become a doctor. So. Uh, we started running around together, and then uh, we kind of decided, well, maybe we'll get married. 
Well, the thing of it is that back then it was, uh, that was a no-no. Yeah. So I uh, went, went to the chaplain and our, our regimental commander, and nope. So lo and behold, two days later I got shipped uh, to Nagasaki, which was as far away from base I was at. Uh, it was clear across to Japan, clear down to the end of Japan. <laughs> And however, at Nagasaki was where they dropped the second atomic bomb. And this, uh, that was a big industrial city. In fact, it was a naval base. And uh, the thing about it is that uh, they, dropped the, they dropped it on the, the uh, Nagasaki had a big hill in the, towards the center of it. Half of, the, half of the city was on one side and half was on the other. Well, the side that they dropped it on was where their, where their naval bases and stuff was. And going down there to see these huge I-beams, maybe one by eights or something, just twisted like a big giant had taken a hold of them and twisted them. And... Uh, I don't know, I forget how many thousands was killed there, uh, but I don't think there was as many killed at Nagasaki as there was at uh, Hiroshima. I think it was 70-some thousand, if I remember right. Yeah, there was. Something like that. But uh, yeah. if they had dropped it on the city, if on the other side of that hill, they would have been probably millions killed. But... Uh, I understand that on the other side of the hill there was an American prisoners there. Yes, there was. That was saved. There prisoners. was also some American prisoners that was at Hiroshima that was killed. Oh. Well, these at Nagasaki, I understand, they was in the caves. They was mining. Yeah. And they was saved. Yep. Yeah. Yep. They, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, from there... Uh, I came home about uh, 1946, uh, just before Christmas, came home and uh, was trying to make up my mind whether I wanted to make the Army a career because I had made sergeant in, in World War II and uh, uh, I, I came back and, and uh, got a job at GE which I uh, didn't like, and uh, I, I figured uh, working in the factory, I, I didn't particularly care for that. So my next door neighbor came out, and he said to me, he said, where are you working? And I said, GE. He says, you'll never make any money there. He says, come on. He says, I'll get you a good job. So I went to work on the railroad, and as a fireman, and uh, so that, uh, that took me up to uh, two or three months as, as a fireman on the railroad, and they sent me to, uh, was going to send me to Stony Island up there, and I said, nope, I'm not going up there. So I came back. I, I'd been an active softball and baseball player, so Hortons wanted to start a... Uh, championship team, so uh, uh, I caught all kinds of fast pitch pitchers, mm -hmm. and uh, so I joined Hortons, and that takes me up to Korea because I, we went to play in the World Softball Tournament in Greeley, Colorado, and uh, that takes me up to my tour in Korea. You know, I was over to the Philippines station there my last year in, and I was stationed at Sangley Point, and it was in Subic, not Subic Bay, but the other part of it. Mm -hmm. And outside of Sangley Point, there was a city called Cavite, and that was a uh, Japanese prison camp there. And they would not let the Japanese, they had uh, ships sunk in that harbor, and they wouldn't allow them in to come back and get them out. To that day, they wouldn't. Yeah, they, in fact, uh, as far as 
I know there was, uh, they've never, the Japanese sank part of the Bank of Japan out, out in the bay by Corregidor, mm -hmm. and uh, the last I heard it was, they still hadn't found it, it was so deep in there, and, but, yeah. uh, Yeah, I, when I come back, I tried to make up my mind whether I was going to re-enlist, which I did. I, I, I had reserve time to serve after World War II, and when that ran out, uh, I, uh, one of my buddies that I played ball with and everything, he said, uh, Ed, uh, you know, he was a sergeant in World War II. You're single. He says they're going to get you again. <laughs> what year was this? This was in 1950. 50. Yeah. Uh, in the in the uh, winter of 19, well, in the spring of 1950. Yeah. So uh, he said, uh, why don't why don't we go out and sign up? He'd never been in the military, so I said, okay, never never dreaming that I would get called back in again, so I, uh, I went out and signed up at Bearfield and everything, and it uh, wasn't very long until <laughs> I got a notice to go to Indianapolis to, yeah. to take physical. Let's back up to when you made the landing in Japan. You said you mentioned the L LCIs. That's landing ship. Landing craft infantry. Oh, There's how least, many uh, troops does that hold? Uh, well, it holds. Uh, I would guess probably. Uh, let's see, a platoon. Two platoons probably holds about uh, thirty people. Uh -huh. Uh, these were the same kind that they used at, at D-Day, and the Marines used uh, all through the islands. And, uh, you know, when they drop the, the front of that down, you're game in there mm -hmm. if they got any, right. any automatic weapons or anything that fires right, in, yeah. right into there. And they were all ready for you there, weren't they? They were all ready for us, yep. They saved a lot of lives by dropping the bombs. Yeah, there. well, they had they had uh, <clears throat> uh, bunkers there and pillboxes, and I know that even the Navy's big bus bomb busters and mm -hmm. couldn't have, couldn't have knocked them out. So uh, they always said that the uh, ocean would run red with American blood. Yes, it would. Well, Ed, I appreciate you being here. It's been interesting. And to the viewers, I want to uh, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to Ed. Uh, remember, uh, freedom is not free. If you see a veteran, walk up to him and shake his hand and say, thank you for your service. Thank you and good night. <laughs>